I'm next in the broadcast in a letter to U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, North Korea's ambassador to the United Nations, says Pyongyang stands firmly against a U.N. resolution that takes aim at North Korea's human rights violations. With Russia's increasing moves to involve itself diplomatically and economically on the Korean Peninsula, we take an inside look at the impact of closer ties by both Koreas with the Kremlin. And despite the original founders of the Hong Kong pro-democracy movement surrendering to police on Wednesday, activists say they will continue their occupation of key parts of the city. Primetime News begins now. Welcome to the program, everyone. You're watching Primetime News, coming to you live from Seoul. I am Kang Tae-ri. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. We begin with ire from North Korea. Pyongyang has sent a letter to U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon saying it would never accept a U.N. resolution calling for the regime to be referred to The Hague for crimes against humanity. By the way, a passage of that resolution is said to be unlikely anyway at this point due to resistance from China and Russia. So South Korea and the U.S. are looking into uh, taking a different tact. Our Pak Ji-won tells us more. In a letter to U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, North Korea's ambassador to the United Nations says Pyongyang cannot and will not accept the adoption of a resolution that takes aim at North Korea's human rights violations. Ambassador Cha Song nam writes that the European Union and Japan, who introduced the draft resolution last month, as well as the United States, had chosen a path of confrontation and that North Korea had no choice but to strengthen its war deterrence. That a North Korean foreign ministry statement says could include another nuclear test. Meanwhile, in a move that aims to keep pressure on Pyongyang and global attention focused on the matter, a group of countries led by South Korea and the U.S. are pushing to put the North Korean human rights issue on the agenda for the U.N. Security Council before the year is up. Nine of the 15 members of the Security Council would need to vote in favor for the agenda to be set. Permanent members, such as China and Russia, cannot wield their veto power when it comes to agenda setting. There is a sense of urgency for setting the agenda, since half of the 10 non-permanent members currently on the council, including South Korea, will see their two-year terms end by the end of this month. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. If confirmed, it will be the first cabinet reshuffle within the Obama administration since the Democrats were defeated in last month's uh, midterm elections. Ashton Carter is reported to be at the top of the list to replace U.S. Chief uh, Def Defense Chief Chuck Hagel. Our Shin Zemin has more. Barring any unexpected setbacks, Ashton Carter looks poised to become the next U.S. Secretary of Defense, replacing Chuck Hagel, who announced plans to step down last week. Carter would be coming into the position with an extensive background in defense matters. He has served as the Deputy Secretary of Defense under Leon Panetta and Chuck Hagel, and as the Undersecretary for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, where he was a Pentagon's chief buyer of weapons and managed its arsenal. Carter is widely known for his experience in managing budgets and weapons contracts. His range of experience is being touted with the multiple crises in the Middle East, namely the threat posed by the Islamic State. On the Asia-Pacific front, Carter has said in the past that military sequestration in the U.S. would not impact the alliance with Korea. It will ensure, ensure that all of its capabilities remain available to the alliance. Uh, there will be a B-52 flight tomorrow. During a visit to Seoul early last year, Carter spoke of the U.S. plan to fly nuclear-capable bombers through South Korean airspace for training purposes in the event of war. If and when Carter is nominated, he'll have to go through the confirmation process, likely under the Republican-led Senate early next year. He is expected to pass through thanks to his past experience at the Pentagon and the fact that he has the respect of many senior military leaders. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. 
Fingers are still being uh, pointed to a word in North Korea as a possible culprit behind last week's uh, cyber attack on Sony Pictures. And though there are even more clues that uh, hint at Pyongyang's involvement, some say it's too soon and too dangerous to jump to any conclusions at this point. Kwon Soa has the details. More clues point to North Korea being the culprit of the recent cyber attack on Sony Pictures. According to Bloomberg, two people they say are credible but not authorized to speak in public said the destructive malware found in Sony's internal system last week contained Korean language code. Other elements found were similar to major attacks on the networks of South Korean banks and TV stations last year, which were blamed on the North. There are parts of this attack and patterns of this attack that look like things North Korea may have done in the past. Others are skeptical. People are initially jumping to the conclusion that because it's coded in Korean, that this might be a North Korea uh, waged attack against Sony in particular or other organizations. Uh, we have to be very careful of jumping to those conclusions and, and automatically assuming attribution in this case. The FBI, which is investigating the case, has not commented on who they think is behind the cyber attack, but has said that the method of attack had only been seen in Asia and the Middle East up until now. Most eyes are on North Korea, though, as the interview, which centers on a CIA plot to assassinate leader Kim Jong-un, is due to hit screens on Christmas Day. The regime has called the comedy an act of terrorism and vowed merciless retaliation. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. And moving on to the latest on the sunken trawler accident, a total of 11 bodies were recovered this Wednesday from search operations for the Korean-operated fishing boat that sank off Russia's eastern coast this past Monday. Of the 11 bodies pulled out of the sea today, Korea's foreign ministry says three were Korean, seven were Indonesian, and one was Filipino. That pushes the official death toll in the disaster to 12, with 41 others still missing. The cause of the accident is still being investigated. Stock prices of Korea's top 10 corporations have been on a slide downward this year. Analysts say shares are taking a hit from worsening economic conditions abroad. But some seem to think the tide may turn. Kim ji has more. The strengthening of the Korean currency and increased competition from China have taken a toll on corporate earnings. Excluding CJ and SK Group, Korea's top 10 corporate groups are feeling the heat. Their share prices have tumbled so far this year. The shipbuilding and petrochemical sectors were among the hardest hit. Shares of Hyundai Heavy Industries have dropped the most by nearly 53 percent. Shares of Samsung Group have also fallen by nearly 4 percent this year. It's a similar story for the other 488 listed companies. Their combined net profit fell nearly 13 percent during the January to September period, from the same period last year to around 45 and a half billion U.S. dollars. The company's worsening earnings are being reflected in their stock prices, but Korean shares will likely pick up next year as external conditions improve following economic recoveries in many major global markets. Taishin Securities predicts Korea's main benchmark KOSPI will hit 2,250 at some point from the current 1,900 level. Goldman Sachs also forecasts the KOSPI to top the 2,300 level next year, which would be an all-time high. Kim Jong, Arirang News. Korea and Japan share a similarity. Their chronically low birth rates and getting more couples hitched so that can, uh, they can start families as a potential solution. But uh, what do Koreans and Japanese really think about marriage? Our Kim min tells us more. An aging population and low birth rate, two problems that Korea and Japan have in common and are trying to solve. And since having children out of wedlock is considered socially unacceptable in either country, the focus is on encouraging people to get married. So the country shares similar problems, but do the people of Korea and Japan share similar views on marriage? A report by the Korea Institute for Health and Social Affairs says no. 
In surveys on over 10,000 single men and women from Japan between the ages of 18 and 49 and 1,500 Koreans in the same age group, more than 80% of Korean men said marriage comes with benefits, while just about 60% of Japanese men agreed. As for women, roughly 7 in 10 from both countries said marriage was beneficial. Their reasons? Koreans were more based on emotion. The number one reason given was knowing they could rely on their spouse for emotional support. Being allowed to live with their loved one came next on the list. The Japanese respondents, on the other hand, tended to be more practical, with the number one reason being to have children. This was trailed by emotional support and fulfilling the expectations of their parents and relatives. But, as we all know, marriage comes after dating. But Japanese men seem to be more reluctant about dating than Korean men. Nearly three-quarters of Japanese men who took the survey said they were not in a relationship in comparison with 66% of Korean men. The report says all this stems from Japan's prolonged economic slump, which has changed their spending patterns, making them focus more on their own life rather than a relationship. However, it warns that Korea is no exception to the situation given its slow economic growth and call for efforts to reduce the burdens on young people that keep them from tying the knot. Kim min Arirang News. Until recently, Russia was a relatively passive observer on the Korean Peninsula. But this year, we've seen a sudden outburst of political exchanges and economic cooperation between Pyongyang and Moscow. That's right. And uh, they haven't left out Seoul as well as Russia also increased its cooperation with South Korea. And to tell us more, our Hwang sung Yee joins us in the studio. So Russia is uh, certainly um, angling to be a key player in this, right? That's right. Yes, in fact, South Korea's chief nuclear envoy, Hwang Jung-guk, held talks with his Russian counterpart in Moscow today. Um, not much detail has been released on that meeting, but it, this comes just weeks after uh, Choi Ryong-hae, a close aide to North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, met with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. The two had agreed to increase efforts to resume the six-party nuclear talks. And the South Korean envoy was likely debriefed on that meeting by his Russian counterpart. So, like you said, Cherry, mm. Russia is assuming an interesting role on the Korean Peninsula along with the traditional key players, which are, of course, the two Koreas, China, and the United States. Mm, very interesting. So, Sung Yi, let's uh, stay right there. And uh, we're going to bring in uh, Daniel Pinkston. Uh, he's the Northeast Asia Deputy Project Director with the International Crisis Group in Seoul uh, to help us uh, go in-depth on this uh, conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. So, do you think that, oh, so we're seeing a flurry of uh, diplomacy among uh, the six-party member countries. Do you th expect, hope for a, any breakthrough in the stalled nuclear talks? Well, there, there's been uh, past consultation uh, among the members. Uh, they do that periodically. So it's not uh, new uh, or a new development. Um, I'm quite pessimistic because the six-party talks were established to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. Uh, North Korea would define uh, success or, or progress in the talks as uh, the other parties accepting its nuclear status. And there's no uh, reversal or sign of reversal of this. And until that time comes, I don't see any uh, progress in the talks. So we've been seeing a lot of activity from Pyongyang in terms of their establishing a bilateral one-on-one -on -one agreements or talks with various nations. Do you think they're trying to shift the paradigm or do you think they're stalling or are just uh, trying to see what they can get um, on a one-off relationship? Well, they're very consistent with their objectives and their, their strategies and policies to achieve those objectives. North Korea wants to be recognized as an equal. They want to normalize relations with the, the rest of the world. They want to expand uh, economic ties. They want to reduce their economic dependence on China. So they want to be recognized as a nuclear state. And as long as other uh, countries are willing to have dialogue and accept them on Pyongyang's terms, then they're very happy to do that. But most of the wor world uh, is not willing to do that. 
So what do you think is a workable framework for any sort of dialogue on North Korea's nuclear program? Well, it depends what you want to do. If you want to accept uh, North Korea as a nuclear state, lift all the sanctions and normalize relations with them, uh, then we can just do that and acquiesce uh, to a new status quo, appease them, give them everything they want. But of course, uh, I'm being a little bit sarcastic here. That's not politically acceptable, and that's not going to happen. Pyongyang must change its ideology. They must abandon their uh, Sungun ideology, their military first ideology, and seek uh, national security, economic development, and uh, normal relations with the outside world through some other means. Do you think that Russia has a chance to exercise greater uh, influence by, um, you know, engaging more with North Korea, say, on China? Uh, right now, Russia and North Korea have uh, strong incentives to cooperate because they both are under international sanctions and under uh, political pressure mm -mm. for different reasons, of course, but they both seek uh, sanctions relief. They both would like to uh, undermine the sanctions uh, regime. North Korea is a, a conduit or a, a um, uh, way for North, or excuse me, for Russia to establish rail networks, energy uh, uh, networks, to link up with uh, Japan and mm. South Korea, and that's where the big economic prize is. Right, and speaking of those connections by rail or those economic projects that do also involve uh, South Korea in this uh, trio, do you think Russia's involvement can be seen more as a bridge or a connector, or do you think it's more of a meddler? Well, I think uh, cooperation from all the, the parties uh, is required. Uh, but unfortunately, North Korea has a, a number of uh, commitment problems. Uh, I don't see where the money is going to come from, who is going to invest in there, how they can make uh, credible commitments to uh, uphold contracts and so forth. We saw the problems in the Kaesong Industrial Complex uh, last year, and uh, they can renege on uh, commitments at any time. They've done it uh, several times in the past. So unless they can overcome those commitment problems, I don't see how these uh, projects are going to be completed. All right, Daniel Pinkston, thank you so much for your insights tonight. And Sung Yi, thank you so much for joining us here in the studio. My pleasure. The main founders of the Occupy Central movement in Hong Kong have turned themselves into police. This as the pro-democracy protesters defy their calls to end the months-long occupation due to concerns of rising violence. With more, we turn to Paul Yee at the News Center. Paul, this seems to be a heavy blow to the movement, especially since a revival of protests earlier this week seemed to indicate they were actually regaining some momentum. That's right, but it was those same violent clashes that pushed the three Occupy Central founders to surrender to authorities. They said they wanted to take responsibility for the widespread protests, which the government has condemned as illegal. The three men were questioned on Wednesday and then to free, allowed to freely leave the Central Police Station without facing any charges. Earlier, student protest leaders and fellow supporters rejected calls from the Occupy Central leadership to leave and vowed to keep putting pressure on the government. The Occupy Central co-founders are urging people to pull out of key protest sites from the city center over fears of further violence, saying the movement had de deviated from its peaceful beginnings. And shifting to the U.S., President Barack Obama has urged Congress to approve plans which calls for over $6 billion to help fight Ebola in West Africa. President Obama outlined the new plan during a tour of the National Institutes of Health in Maryland on Tuesday. Researchers there had recently published promising results from the first human trial of a potential Ebola vaccine. Amid rising hopes, Obama stressed that the battle against the deadly disease was far from over. We cannot beat Ebola without more funding. If we want other countries to keep stepping up, we will have to continue to lead the way. And that's why I'm calling on Congress to approve our emergency funding request to fight this disease. Earlier, the medical charity group Doctors Without Borders released a fresh report criticizing the international community for its response to the epidemic as patchy and slow. 
And finally, turning to the Middle East, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has sacked two of his top ministers, paving the way for snap elections. Netanyahu accused his now former justice and finance ministers of conspiring behind his back in a bid to oust him from power. Both have denied the allegations. In a briefing on Tuesday, the prime minister said he would call for parliament to be dissolved as soon as possible. It makes it impossible to run a government and makes it impossible to lead a country. Therefore, a short while ago, I instructed the cabinet secretary to issue dismissal letters to ministers Livni and Lapid. The center's Yes Atid party has called the firing of the ministers an act of cowardice and loss of control. And that wraps up our look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello and welcome, I'm Stephen Chair with a look at sports. Now, Real Madrid is one of the most well-known teams in the world, and everyone knows they win a lot. But the winning streak they're currently on is out of this world, even by their own galactic standards. In the midweek Copa del Rey matchup, the defending League Cup champions beat Cornea 5-0 to advance 9-1 on aggregates to the round of 16. Now it's their 17th straight win in all competitions, including the La Liga, League Cup and Champions League, extending the team record. And during the run, which started September 16th, the Galacticos scored an unbelievable 64 goals while giving up just nine. They'll look to keep it going in a league match against Celta Vigo on Saturday. And coming home for Wednesday's games, first to the KBL doubleheader. The Koyang Orions faced off against the Anyang KGC. Now the two-point game at the half blows open in the third quarter as KGC comes alive. And in the end, all but one player record a bucket as KGC gets the road win over the Orions. And in Busan, the Samsung Thunders claw back against the KT Sonic Boom and send it to overtime. There, it stays level once again, forcing a second OT. Now, Samsung's Leo Lions' rare triple-double deserves a mention, but KT's Cho Sung Min is the hero here with his two clutch free throws, giving the big win to the Sonic Boom. And over to the V-League. First to the ladies, the Hyundai ENC Hill State hosted the Korea Expressway Zenith in Suwon. And the Zenith put up a fight, but the Hill State and Polina Rahimova are just too strong. Hyundai ENC wins in straight sets to take first on the standings. Meanwhile, to the men, the Kepco Vic Storm forced the deciding set after taking, a, taking an epic fourth set over the OK Savings Bank Russian Cash. And Kepco bring the storm, edging out the last set for the win. And finally, Australia's swimming governing body has banned Chinese swimmer Sun Yang from training in the country over his unfolding doping scandal. Swimming Australia announced it told Sun's Australian coach Dennis Cotterell that the two-time Olympic champion would be barred from Australian pools, effectively severing ties. They said integrity was of the utmost importance, likely referring to the belated announcement of Sun's three-month suspension from May this year for failing an in-competition drug test. And that wraps it up for now. Stay tuned for your weather up next. Have a great night. Hello and happy Wednesday. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with your weather forecast. So it was a cool day here in Korea and at the moment the nation is under cloudy skies and a strong wind watch as well as cold wave watch has been issued for parts of Gangwon province. And from later tonight more snow is forecast. In fact, heavy snowfall advisories have been issued for some regions including both Chungcheong provinces which may get over 15 centimeters and it looks like elsewhere will get about 7 centimeters. 
The snowy conditions will continue through tomorrow morning, so be extra careful on the roads to your morning commute. On to tomorrow's readings. Seoul starts off the day at minus 6 degrees before reaching minus 1 in the afternoon. Gwangju hits 4, Busan reaches 8. On to other regions. Jeju makes it to 8, Tokdo hits 4, Mount Kumgang drops to minus 11. Those are the updates we're following at this hour. Stay warm. I'll be back with more after midnight. See you then. Thank you very much, Po Gyeong, and that's primetime news for this Wednesday. Thanks for watching. I'm Kang Teddy. And I'm Sean Lim. Have a great night. We'll see you soon.